Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast, brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. I'd like to present to you some work I was doing earlier this week. There was a paper I read earlier this week in the journal Nature that was looking at something called vapor pressure deficit in Brazil. Now, what we were looking for here was to kind of get a better understanding on the longer-term trends of the dry season and when it ends and when the monsoon starts, because that's critical for planting progress in Brazil. So looking at their dry season, which is August, September, and October, they were analyzing a couple of areas. Look over here on the upper left. This region right into here was the one I was most uh, concerned about. What they found is that looking over the last 40 years, both the Southeast Amazon and that region in Northwestern Brazil have seen really a systematic increase in vapor pressure deficit. Now remember, vapor pressure is just the partial pressure of water vapor in the atmosphere. In other words, it tells you how much moisture is in the atmosphere. And if that deficit's increasing, that means that the dry season is getting drier and possibly longer. Now to understand that, I went and did just a bit of my own work here and I plotted for you over here on the right, October total rainfall from 1981 to 2019 from the ERA-5 data set. And this is only for Mato Grosso in Brazil. And what I found was that during that 40 year time period, there has been uh, on average, using the linear trend here, about an, a reduction of an inch of total rainfall. And so I, I'm doing this because this particular year, we know that the monsoon kind of started a bit late and did so in kind of fits and spurts. And so when we look over here at this map, which shows you the last 30 days of precipitation in terms of uh, precipitation anomalies, we do see that a lot of Brazil's growing areas are looking dry right now. Now, speaking specifically about Mato Grosso, I produced two plots over here on the left. They look at the daily mean precipitation accumulation compared to normal in the top, and then each individual day's precipitation here from the CPC data on the bottom. So what this shows you is that normally we would see uh, at the end of September into October, this is the normal rate of accumulation of precipitation. This year, things were a bit flat. That was the late arrival of the monsoon and then its weak start. It then really cranked up once we got into mid to end of October, and that's when we saw the most rapid planting progress. But right in through here, there's been some problems as of late. So to understand those, let's go to the graphic on the bottom. You see here at the beginning of November, right in through here, there were several days in a row where the temperatures were relatively warm and the precipitation really just shut off. And as a consequence, some of the soybeans that were trying to germinate at this time, I think, failed to do so. We're starting to hear reports uh, coming out of Mato Grosso that there's a lot of replant activity going on here. So this is just a, kind of a presentation of what we've seen so far this year. And I think it's going to be critical to watch this as we move throughout the year. Let's do that first just in the near term. And let's take a look at what's going on with our root zone soil moisture. So this was just a couple of days ago. We do see the pockets of dryness as measured by GRACE, which is a satellite-based measurement here of roots on soil moisture. So unlike some of, a lot of the most recent years, this has been a bit of a tough start to the growing season for some in Brazil. Now into that forecast, we see that over the next week, the heaviest rains are going to be located north, either over the Amazon or in northeastern Brazil. And there's going to be less than normal precipitation as predicted by the European model south of that line I drew, which includes most of Brazil's primary growing area. We are going to watch for late, later on in this next seven days for precipitation chances to increase in parts of Argentina. And the models all week long continue to advertise this wetter spot here into week two. But at that same time period, notice the dryness that is being picked up by the models here in Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sol, over toward Bahia, Tocantins, Minas Gerais, those areas. So again, this is just showing us that this monsoon has not necessarily come in full strength like Brazil would want it to be coming in. Now, the La Nina is back to kind of being the more dominant factor controlling the tropics, and I'll explain why in just a few moments. But I did some other work yesterday, and I want to re-show you some stuff that was in my long-range analysis yesterday, and I want you to go watch that because I'm not going to spend much time on this figure today. So using some data here by NOAA, we looked at uh, temperature and precipitation patterns. I'll draw a line down the middle so it's easier to see. Temperature on the left, precipitation on the right for our strongest, uh, our moderate, and our weak La Nina events. And we used this in yesterday's long range to kind of supplement some of those long range forecasts. But what I want to show you is I did that same work and reproduced a map for Brazil. So using all of the La Nina years since 19. 81 in the era 5 data. What I just want to tell you is that doing that and putting it together, while there was a lot of variability, in other words, it didn't mean that every La Nina made things dry in Brazil, the consistent theme here is that we might struggle with precipitation for the next three months 
across sections of Brazil and maybe even Argentina as well. So this is just kind of following up on that presentation from yesterday and I encourage you to go watch that. Okay, coming back to the United States, over the last 72 hours, we can see the onshore flow in the western part of the United States bringing in a lot of coastal precipitation, hitting the Klamath Mountains in northern uh, California and also the Sierra Nevada, which is really great. We want to see that moisture early. The rest of the country dominated by higher atmospheric pressure, and all that it really did was give us some good lake effect snow here coming off of our Great Lakes. So where are we going with this pattern? Well, the high pressure that was sitting over the middle part of the country is sliding off toward the mid-Atlantic and will sit here by midday. And one of the consequences of this is look at the flow that's going to come around us out of Texas through parts of the Mid-South and into the Midwest of the United States and over toward the Eastern Corn Belt. We are expecting very strong winds within this corridor today. We do have uh, red flag warnings out and high wind advisories in that region. We get some downslope flow here too and some very warm conditions in the central part of the United States. Meanwhile, we will be watching what's coming out of this region, and that's going to be a target region for us to watch throughout the rest of this video and understanding where this pattern is going. So our all hazards weather map, we do have winter weather advisories that are out for parts of Montana, North Dakota, northern Minnesota, as well as this part of the Rocky Mountains. But this section right in through here expecting to have strong winds today uh, and in addition to that a fire threat. Okay, We do have some pretty cold area here in the coastal Carolinas, excuse me, cold air this morning in the coastal Carolinas where we do have a freeze uh, warning that's in place as those temperatures bottom out this morning underneath those calm, clear skies and higher atmospheric pressure. So let's take a look at what we're are going to watch uh, in terms of our near-term weather pattern. So you can already see the high pressure cell sitting here. And then last night we did see some light precipitation, some light snow even moved through parts of the Dakotas. Meanwhile, across the west we still have our stronger onshore flow. Now the reason why we have that winter weather advisory that's out today, well this is getting through 10 a.m. and through midday today on Thursday. Notice coming through parts of Montana into North Dakota, you know, southern parts of Saskatchewan and Manitoba, we do have this quick hitting front that's going to pass through and bring some chances for some snow. And that's going to pass into Minnesota and eventually over to Ontario as we work our way into tomorrow morning. And as I play this forward, things really kind of clear out as we work our way into Saturday. And it's on Saturday where we start to see the next setup taking place. You see as that high pressure cell moves east and another one pulls in behind it, we're going to squeeze the air right in through here. It's going to have some frontogenesis, the, the creation of a front. And we're expecting to see some relatively heavy precipitation along that boundary. Now to see this all unfold, I always do this. I want to take you to the upper levels and I want to talk to you about the pattern before we work back into those details. Something I want you to understand about the pattern I'm about to show you. I got five things real quick. I don't see any blocking over the Arctic. No big high pressure cells over the Arctic. Secondly, if we have a positive Arctic oscillation, if we have a positive EPO pattern and a positive NAO, even if it's just slightly so, that's going to be more of a what I would call a relaxed pattern across North America in terms of temperatures. If we add that to the fact that the polar vortex is quite strong and the MJO has kind of collapsed into null space, we're doing a lot here to, you know, really allow the atmosphere to keep in its current configuration of cranking out low pressure systems right in here. Okay, so with all that kind of in the background, watch as I play this forward. Let's pause it right here. I just took you out through this weekend. So if we just step back. What we see is, you know, generally relatively faster winds cutting right in through here. And at the end of the week with the high pressure sitting off to the south, this will be the area through which we're going to have our front set up. But notice it's just going to be an elongated front, no big low pressure center cutting through there. As we go forward, keep an eye up here in the Arctic. We just don't see big dominant ridging. In fact, there's several troughs spinning up through here near Greenland and near Alaska. As we then go through the weekend into Sunday, you do see a little shortwave cutting through. I'll show you the impacts of that in just a few moments because that will produce a low that will eventually cut through the Great Lakes in Ontario. But then it moves. You see that? See the atmosphere staying open and moving and working out into next Tuesday and then in next Wednesday. We do need to have a discussion about next Wednesday and what this trough here is going to do for the Midwest. But again, trough, trough. And if I just play this, you're just going to keep seeing that happen. Troughing happening in here, sweeping through the northwest. And the pattern keeps resetting itself back over to these deep troughs between the Bering Sea uh, here, the Arctic, and the Gulf of Alaska. And that's going to be our source region looking our way all the way out to the first week of December. But if the cold air is here, and the cold air is there, the chances of getting sustained much below average temperatures across the United States and Canada is relatively limited. Okay, that's the setup. Let's now see those details. 
today. Look at the high pressure cells sitting here and look at how strong the winds are in this pressure gradient. Meanwhile, in the west, the onshore flow bringing mountain snows and valley rains there. We've talked about this through this point. Okay, here we are on Saturday morning. You can now start to see the front forming right here from Oklahoma, Kansas, through Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And as I play this forward, this is Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, now getting into Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon and evening. Now that front's going to linger there throughout much of the weekend until that trough I showed you cuts in and starts to create a low. And as that low goes through Indiana and Ohio and eventually pushes toward right in this part of Ontario, we're going to have a tough call right here on the boundary between where the rain and snow will be. We're going to watch it carefully right into this area early, early next week or actually really late in the weekend. Now going into early next week, we see high pressure takes back over and pushes through the eastern corn belt. But by Tuesday, what I'm watching very carefully will be the formation on Tuesday morning, afternoon, and evening of another low that could come right out of here out of Colorado. And as it moves Tuesday evening into Wednesday morning over my home state of Illinois, we could see some severe weather to the south here in the lower Mississippi River Valley. And then as this pulls farther to the east, it could crank up and bring in more precipitation here to the northeast with a trailing cold front that cuts all the way through the mid-Atlantic, down through the Carolinas, and down here into the southeast. So when I, when I saw that, I, I've been watching this over the last couple of days, and I'm going to bring you up to speed on what that second low is going to do, because I think we've really touched quite a bit on the thing that's going to happen this weekend in this part of the country. So looking at it, I want to show you the European Ensemble, which is here. Notice that the models out for next Wednesday morning are more focused on developing the low here uh, in parts of um, Alberta and Saskatchewan and not so much, a little bit more disperse on the potential low forming in this area. And just remember the operational model at this time wants to pull the low right through Illinois at this point. And like I said, I'll watch out down here for strong to severe storms and a pretty chilly rain around the northern side of this. And why we're just discussing this is because this will be the day before Thanksgiving. And if you are able to travel, I just want to make you aware of some travel issues here in the midsection of the U.S. Interesting left, the Zero Z GFS has a very similar setup for that time period. Instead of having the low like over southern Illinois, it's just got it right here over central and western Illinois. So both models right now picking up on that same feature with the secondary low on the backside here. Okay, going out and just looking at total accumulated precipitation through Friday, getting into Saturday, that's when we start to see the boundary setting up here. Saturday through Sunday, we're expecting to see our rain really establishing right here along this region as that low takes shape and moves toward Ontario. Now the models then, look at this, this is that system next Tuesday into Wednesday, add to that. So that's that system we just described right there. If we just put it all together over the next week, we continue to see great rains here uh, for coastal Oregon and Washington, but our, our region right in through here is going to be quite wet. Now, thinking about this in terms of snow, this is just over the next week from the operational European model. We will see in the Cascades a continued buildup of early season snowpack. Love to see that. Same for the Blue Mountains and then the northern uh, Rockies here. But with that second system coming through, we might possibly bring in some snow to Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and then heavy snows from this part of Ontario into Quebec. From there, what about getting out to week two? Well, both the GFS and the European are really keying in on the redevelopment of that low like we talked about. The only difference in the two is that the GFS is much quicker at ejecting this trough out, whereas the European lets it linger. And the end result is the GFS is drier into week two, as you can see here, except for the northeast, whereas the European over on the right with the lingering trough is going to show up with wetter conditions here, uh, basically from the lower Mississippi River Valley through the Ohio River Valley into the northeast. All right. From there, let's talk about temperatures. This is the way that November's started so far. And remember, it was the first 10 days of November that was extremely hot in here. And since then, the temperatures have backed off a bit. As we look at what's going to control our temperatures, we're going to start off here with what's going on in the Arctic and up in the stratosphere. Our polar vortex, as you see here through the next 10 days, is focusing a lot of the coldest air deep in the uh, troposphere and stratosphere right over this area. There does seem to be some ridging at this level over parts of Scandinavia, north of the Ural Mountains. But other than that, this is not really a disturbed polar vortex. I can explain to you what I mean by just looking at this animation over here uh, on the left. Polar vortex is currently sitting you know, right here. And you can see the winds around it. And when I show you these plots, just let me make this a little bit clearer. These plots are looking at 60 degrees north at that wind you see over there on, on the left. And as we've been talking about, remember, it's when those winds 
aren't way up high on this graph, but instead fall off down here, that we get a problem with our polar vortex and a weakening. It's currently sitting right here, which is above average, okay? So that's why we see a strong polar vortex, and it's really going to keep a pretty tight grip on, uh, on our uh, temperatures, keeping them cold up there over the Arctic. The MJO isn't really helping much either. You see here it's collapsing into null space, and there's some questions. Is it going to pop out in phase 6 or phase 5 or maybe phase 4? And if you look at the European data, the latest, I'm just going to draw a line right here where our easterlies are meeting the westerlies here in the tropics. And it seems to be happening right over phase 5. So if this does emerge in phase 5, what would that mean in terms of supporting temperatures across North America? Well, historically, it tends to make more troughs over Alaska. We've been talking about that. And then more ridging, you know, somewhere here across North America. So we're just looking at putting all the pieces together to kind of arrive at this map. This is today's maximum temperatures. Compared to normal, we do have pockets in the central part of the U.S. under those strong southerly winds that'll be upwards of 25 to 30 degrees above average. Now, that's not going to last forever. And you see as I go from the day here on Thursday into Friday, the warmth moves, uh, you know, back to the east. But then as we get into Saturday... Right in through here, we're going to go back over to slight cool bias, whereas much of the rest of the country does see some warmer conditions compared to average, though, remember? So if it's 40 here in Minneapolis, that's still a little bit warmer than normal for late November uh, in, in, uh, in Minneapolis here. So moving forward, this is getting into Sunday and Monday. So a lot of that was rain cooled the air in this area. Going from Monday into Tuesday and now into Wednesday, again, we start to just see warmer than average conditions by a few degrees here. And it's tending to last. This is the day 5 through 10. Again, that pattern really favoring above average temperatures by a few degrees here, looking out at this time period, which gets us all the way to the 29th of November. And then going here into the beginning of December, with all the cold air really tucked over you know, Alaska and Greenland, we just have broad scale warmth. The cooler weather here, it's that trough I just mentioned a few moments ago that lingers off the East Coast. But it's just a couple of degrees colder than normal. So where is all the cold air? This will be my last slide. It's here and it's here. And what's interesting is that if you can imagine going north from the central plains of the U.S. and then coming back over here into Siberia, that is the, the pocket that's warm. So the cold is tucked in between there and there. And if you want to understand when the pattern is going to break, watch the Gulf of Alaska. Watch Greenland first. That will be the change happens first. Okay, that's all I got for you today. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.